a hole breach isn't going to be that detrimental. It's just you have a hole in this. You have a window you weren't expecting before. <laughs> Maybe a tripping hazard, right? right. I'm Nerdarkus Ted. And I'm Nerdarkus Dave. Welcome, Welcome to, to Nerdarchy. For nerds, by nerds. nerds. Dave. What do you think is the best thing about adding airships, boats, or spell jammers to your D&D game? Uh, Ted, this is easy. Whatever the vessel is, it becomes another character in the story, in my opinion. Like, we played a Star Wars game, and it was basically the Millennium Falcon-style ship that we kind of, like, retrofitted out and gave it a paint job. And, like, it became a big deal for several characters in the game. Like, they're all about the ship and making sure enough it happened to it. In D&D games, I've used the boat for multiple counter scenarios and the players love that. They loved having the ship super involved. So, like I said, it becomes another character in the story. Ted, what is the best thing about adding a airship, spell jammer, or some kind of other vessel or uh, vehicle into your D&D games? The great thing about adding vehicles into your game, specifically boats, airships, that kind of stuff, is it can involve all the pillars of the game. First and foremost, if you're discovering it, it's exploration. You've got the ability to encounter you know, new things. You, you can fight off whoever was there first. You can get into lore of like, what is this vessel? How did it interact with history? Or if there are people people on it, it is something that can become a social uh, encounter as well. So it's so easy to encounter all of these things. Beyond that, it goes even further because having this vessel, it's going to allow you to travel to new and different locations, whether you're getting to new continents, new planets, new solar systems, whatever have you. It's just awesome from all directions. Now we've used different vehicles in different games that we've played, you know, several of them. I just got back from d and in the Castle where I read my Other Skies game, which uses airship. You've just finished up a campaign where we're on a sailing boat. We used to play an annual Thanksgiving Eve game where we used a spell jammer. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've played several other like sci-fi RPGs where there's a starship involved. In my boat game, you guys actually ended up with a spell jamming vessel that you were using, you know, to kind of complete the overarching quest. As I mentioned, like I've run Other Skies, which is an Arcana Punk setting. It's not related to, but there is definitely some inspiration from Ebron and how things are done in Ebron, which is also another Arcana Punk kind of campaign setting where you not only have airships, but you also have sailing boats that are powered by elementals. Uh, you have the lightning rail which is basically a train so there's a bunch of stuff in there so it can be super important in a lot of different settings that are not necessarily like traditional D, D, and but you can still go with fantasy and the great thing about the airships is each setting almost seems to have a unique way of how these airships tend to work so whatever that mechanic is there's always some way to foul it up and once you're once you foul up a air vessel things can go south real quick yeah you you foul up a, a, a regular sailing vessel and okay, well, you gotta get new sails, you gotta get new masts, but you're not instantly going to die unless you actually damage the ship itself. Whereas like if you're in the sky and you stop it from being able to be in the sky, you're going to crash and that's going to be bad news. Well, I would say like they both actually have different ways, right? Where they're, they're kind of comparable, right? Like in a sense, like you can damage the hull of a ship and it'll begin sinking. Right, that's mm -hmm. that's a problem. But the propulsion system doesn't matter. You're just kind of stuck, right? But it doesn't mean instant death. It could mean death eventually. Sure. But not instant death. Airship or spell jammer. Uh, if you're in an atmosphere, maybe the the way the magic works, a hole breach isn't going to be that detrimental. It's just you have a hole in this. You have a window you weren't expecting <laughs> before. Maybe a tripping hazard, right? right. But you damage the propulsion system. Now you're in real danger because uh, maybe in spell a spell jamming vessel, not so much. Maybe you're just drifting and it's not a big deal. But an airship. Uh, and you go from drifting to plummeting. You, so you ran this Ether Skies game on on the channel. It was sponsored by Open Legend. You know, do you want to get into in, into that campaign a little bit here? Sure. So you know, Open Legend sponsored us to do a whole campaign using their system, and we threw it to the patrons, and they voted on the genre, and it was like really qu close between fantasy, steampunk, and Eldritch horror. So we matched them together and got okay. Mushy, mushy, mushy. We're gonna do that, and um. And then, like, so I came up with this idea that there's these 13 flying cities, and you go back and forth via airships. And there was actually, like, a train system that we never really got into that was kind of discussed. That might come up in latter games. But, you know, that, that being said, like, when we introduced this component into the games, the players really bought into having their own ship and, and making it their own. Um, 
in the open legend game you guys were given a ship and you know really took on like the idea of having this super cool sleek prototype you know better than anything in the air and you know your character in particular was very techy or kind of techy so like it was totally their jam and they took a lot of pride in maintaining the ship and also the ship had npcs on it that added more character so because you had decided that you were going to run ether skies again both of us went and rewatched because it's up on the channel if you want to watch you know the 13 episodes that comprise this story there's a link we'll put it up uh, right over here you can come come check that out but you know it was really enjoyable to kind of go back to that to that old campaign and and see the the fun and the chaos of being on that boat and interacting in this with this world and this weird stories but you decided you were going to run this at D, D in a castle and revisit this setting post that story so what did that look like as always when i run uh games at D, &D in a castle I, or just games in general like i like to give like here's four options that I would like to play, pick one. And they picked Other Skies in this particular case. And it was fun to kind of reintroduce some of the concepts from that game. They really got into not just the ship as aspect of it, but even more so the crew. Like they had a lot of fun creating NPCs that were on their crew and coming up with different names. And, and they didn't like come up with them all at once, but they slowly introduced them throughout the games. They had fun naming the ship in this case. They, you know, they didn't get a ship with a name already. And then later on, they even got to upgrade it. And they got to even use the cannons on the ship, which they really loved until someone used the cannons of a ship back on them. Then they loved it a lot less, but it was a good time. Cannons uh, notwithstanding, uh... Uh, you know, what other kind of, you know, boats, vehicles have, uh, you know, we kind of experimented with here? So the early days of Nerdarchy, um, we played a lot more games online. There used to be a one-shot group and we just randomly, like, hey, I'll run a game. And I ran several Eberron-inspired games. It was like the earliest of the Earth-Earth Arcana had come out. Everyone was really excited about Eberron. And, you know, we used airships in those, in those games. We used the lightning rail in those games. In some cases, you know, there was both. <laughs> and it just gave, like, interesting places and encounter areas you know, have an adventure right like uh escorting the bad luck lady you can probably find it online somewhere was the idea that you guys had to take the lightning rail and protect the, one of the passengers and get them from point a to point b so it almost became like the train itself where it was all these encounter areas and you know there were fights inside the cars there were fights on top of the, the lightning rail which added you know extra tension and drama because if you were knocked off you might take a bunch of damage but you were definitely out of the fight and that's that's the part that I was going to get into with each of these kinds of things. Whether you're talking about a regular boat, whether you're talking about a spell jammer, whether you're talking about an airship, or you know even something as you know wacky as the lightning rail, there is mechanics around whatever it is that you're you're whatever you're vesseling, whatever whatever you're driving. Because if you fall off a regular boat, you are now in water. There are rules for that. If you fall off an airship, you're now in the air. Do you have a fly speed or some way to like teleport? You know, if not you've got some serious problems. So like, you have to be aware of all of these kinds of situations. And that's that adds to the fun, that adds to the tactics of things. Not only do you as the player have the ability to have these things used against you, but you then can use them against your adversaries as well. So I love adding those things in because it's, it adds a new a new element. There's, there's new tactics that can be employed because you have a different environment than just, we are all standing on the ground. Well, you know, speaking of you love the run, you ran a, we love the boat, a 12 session arc for 5e D &D. Yeah, we, we live on a boat uh it was definitely this you know fun fun little uh arc that i ran sadly this one is not on the channel or anything it's you know was our was our home game i i kind of treated uh the situation of all right the players were just mercenaries that slowly over the course got attuned to the people on the boat and you know the boat itself and of course anytime you've got a, a scenario like this what do you have to do You've got to kill people and you've got to destroy the boat. So as the story unfold, they had to be on water because they were escorting something that others were after. And as long as it was on open water, it couldn't be tracked. You know, so what did I have to do? I had to ground them. I had to get them off the boat. And that created all kinds of like fun and problems. And I really enjoyed that aspect because like while from a narrative perspective, it's like, all right, well, you know, Ted is being mean. He's trying to punish the players. I I was trying to give them a cool story of what kind of problems are you going to come up with that they have to overcome because it wasn't a scenario of just, oh, you know where you were going. They were essentially waiting for a sign from an NPC's god or goddess, which was out of their head. So it was just filling time 
and was was really you know a, a bit of a struggle in some regards because there was no dungeons to explore there were no elements it was the players interacting with themselves and interacting with the npcs and whatever encounters wound, wound up coming up so i know like you know when you begin to talk about travel and immersion like you can enter in some of these like random uh, random effects and we you know previously talked about that but here it was it was more than that because it was all like all encompassing story you know and as i kind of previously said like all right their their boat was destroyed so now what do they do so i always love the concept of like the ship in the bottle where they crash landed on this island there happened to be one of these like powerful casters who had these magical bottles that could literally suck things into it so they wound up finding several of these boats uh and one of them happened to look like a kraken so out of the Spelljammer books there was a the kraken ship so then once they determined that that was the one that they wanted there was a person that was on it who claimed that it was his vessel it wasn't his it was a haunted vessel so like there were new new areas to explore so they got to basically do a dungeon crawl in this new ship before they could wind up really getting away from it and because it was a spell jammer they then got to go under the water and over the water and have have a little bit more fun with their boat than what they had had with all of the you know the previous vessels that they had been on this particular spell jamming vessel was totally transmedium capabilities so that was like a fun element that was kind of getting and it added into it because it kind of had a captain quote unquote uh it introduced an npc for us to interact with and you kind of rated some of the, all the other cool things that that you know were involved uh what, what do you think was like one of the most challenging parts for you running you know we live on a boat so the the, the biggest problem with that is uh the, the players are stuck so if you don't have the town or random things happening to occupy their attention, they can just be like, all right, well, I'm just gonna sit and wait for something. So if you didn't have prompts to play with, there was a lot of that, oh, well, what happens next? So not all players are going to be the ones reaching and grabbing. And while I thought I came up with some really interesting NPCs, they weren't ones that, that my players were like latching onto and trying to come up with. So I wrote a lot of backstory and subplot and whatnot for characters that never wound up getting explored because the players weren't attaching themselves to those NPCs. Actually, it kind of like brings up like, like kind of a key thing and key tenet of Nerdarchy, right? Like, and that is the fact that we later had to get more crew and hire them on and like we tended to be more vested in the new crew in some ways than we were in the old crew sure because you know in that instance ted had given us some agency as well of like oh well what kind of people do you hire who do you bring on anytime you do that it just seems like the players are going to care more about them and connect with them a bit deeper than if you the gm are like here's a list of people and maybe some defining traits sometimes one or two will catch on like there was birdie the halfling lookout that really really kind of like captured us for a while, but only because Ted did something horrific to them. Oh, just just because like I had a, a saboteur on the ship and you know, I blinded the lookout. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's what it took for us to actually connect with to some one of the NPCs that Ted actually made. We're like, what? Like nobody cared about Birdie until Birdie lost their eyes. And uh, also there was, and there was like one other one that I liked, the grumpy doer that nobody <laughs> liked. I don't, and my character decided they were going to be best friends. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was kind of amusing, but that was one of those things where like, I, I gave agency, you know, and I think it was you who were like, oh, here's this dude. Um, so initially there were like, 10 positions and 30 crew and just about every episode people were dying from the encounters because none of these were like serious adventurers they were serious sailors mm -hmm. but that did not mean they had the hit points to survive the things that were being thrown against the ship yeah so it all created like a very interesting dynamic indeed if you like this video as well as all the content we put out on nerdarchy.com make sure you like share subscribe even attune to that notification bell quick reminder we drop new videos here on the channel weekly so come on back but you can't wait till then check the cards up here for your next nerdarchy video so until next time stay, stay nerdy, nerdy.